Are you ready to say goodbye to the constant ups and downs of the artist income roller coaster? Whether you're a full-time artist who wants to increase and stabilize your income, a part-time musician who wants to go full-time, or a hobbyist who needs to fund your passion projects, this podcast will equip you with the tools, resources, and inspiration to make it happen. My name is Bree Noble. I'm a musician, best-selling author, and educator whose mission is to help musicians like you to increase the income you're already making and tap into new income streams so you can create a more diverse, stable, reliable income from music and finally ditch the starving artist mentality. Now let's dive into the Profitable Musician Show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast. My name is Bree Noble, and I am here with Mark Miller from Label Coin. And we're going to talk about his journey and how he got to starting this cool new venture. Um, so let's start out, Mark, with your kind of your artist background, because I know you're an indie artist or you were an indie artist. You know, how did you get into music and what made you decide to pursue a career in music? Oh, that's a, that's a great question. So yeah, I started into it right from college. So, uh, you know, that was back in 2005 was when I finished there and just started going into the house shows. But how I decided, you know, I just honestly, I, I just heard somebody singing on the radio when I was like 14. I'm like, that'd be kind of fun to do that. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, I started kind of going down that path and learning a little bit about how to record my own stuff and things. But I was not a good singer and I'm not confident at all. I did not really feel like I wanted to do it. Um, I mean, like I could do it. I wanted to do it. I couldn't do it. So I started out um, in college going for electrical engineering and uh, honestly just felt a really strong divine intervention. Like, nope, this isn't what you're supposed to do. Like there's no plan B music's where you're supposed to be. And so I jumped into, um, to yeah, going to, to music school in Indiana. And I'll, I guess I'll, since you asked about it, I'll give a quick story too. This might be relevant to your, I don't tell the story often. So it might be relevant to your listeners though. Um, I was going to study guitar, you know, when you choose, when you go to college for music you have to pick a primary instrument and so mine was guitar because that's what I was best at most confident at and so I called the school to apply to get into the school and they're like um okay what instrument are you going to choose I'm like oh guitar for sure and they're like are you sure you don't want to do voice um because we really need more male vocalists in our program I'm like yeah I'm pretty sure that you don't want me to do voice (laughs) but um but you know, then I thought about like, well, maybe that's what I'm supposed to do. Like, it would be like, if I'm going to be a singer and if I'm going to like perform, I need to learn how to sing. Right. So I, I go there and audition and um, it was a very classically based school, which I had no concept, no grid for whatsoever. Um, so I go in there and I perform like this, like, like a contemporary pop song on my guitar by myself. You know, most people, they expect you to have an accompanist on the piano while you sing in like Latin or German or oh, yeah. know, so I, that's some the kind of school language. I went to. So I'm familiar. Exactly. Right. And so there I am like shaking uncontrollably trying to accompany myself on this song. And after I finished my, my two songs, there's three professors there on the judging panel. Right. And there's, I kid you not, there was silence for at least 10 seconds. And then finally one of them speaks up and they're like, so are you sure you don't want to study guitar here? <laughs> like, that's what I said the first I was like, time. I was like, yeah. <laughs> and anyways, so I got a letter three weeks later that said, um, congratulations, you've been accepted into pre-music, which, which means like, you know, we're too embarrassed to officially associate you with our program. So we'll let you come and pretend that you belong. And if you improve enough in a year, we'll let you stay. And otherwise we kick you out. And, um, and so I, I improved enough to get to stay. And that's how I learned. And, and so that was kind of that journey coming in. So then after 2005, just going into starting to play small venues, house shows, you know, recorded my first album um, in Nashville. And, uh, and so I was doing that for about five years. That journey got, got to do some really cool stuff and even be an artist in residence in Japan for a year. Met my wife um, in, in 2010 on our honeymoon. She told me she wanted to quit her job and join me in music full time. <laughs> And I said, okay, that's awesome, A, and B, we need a new business plan. <laughs> and so we, uh, we found, uh, discovered the college market and jumped into that space and, and learned how to do that well. By the end of our touring career in 2015, we were touring eight to 10 months a year. We um, had broken $120,000 in 2015. We're like, hey, we're, we're making it. Like, this is, this is working. We're able to like buy this house in Nashville and we're able to have savings and record our albums. And 
Um, but you know, it's crazy, Brie, and you could probably relate to this, um, you know, and with the people you work with too, but you know, that year we made $120,000, 40,000 of that was expenses. So really we made $80,000 then split that between my wife and I, who are both working more than full-time. We're really making like 40 grand a year, 10 years into our career. And at that point, we're officially in the top 2% of our industry. That's true. It, you know, which is crazy, right? Like what other industry is there like that? And so um, we had our second child then and we got off the road um, and started 2016, started Brave Enough Entertainment, um, representing artists with much higher ceilings who are way more talented, who did have great voices, <laughs> could get on shows like American Idol and The Voice and did. And, um, and so then we realized though, as we were like booking them and, and doing artist development, for, you know, artists with hundreds of thousands of followers, you know, or even into the millions, that it was, um, it was stunning to see that they had the same challenges, that they had to have second jobs still, you know, that they had to, you know, find all these different ways to make ends meet and have a struggling finding and building their team. And uh, so we kept always in the back of our mind, how do we get, you know, change this, which kind of brings us up to what we're doing now, but uh, with LabelCoin. Wow. So when you were on the college market, were you like, a, did you have a, a name? Like, were you a duo name or was your wife backing you up or how was that? Uh, yeah, we started out, I was the other Mark Miller was my old name because, you know, there's like 7,000 Mark Millers in the oh, US. probably, yeah. <laughs> MarkMiller.com was, I think, a car dealership. And I think oh. MarkMillerMusic.com was a clarinet teacher or something like that. And so I'm like, well, I guess I'm the other one. So that's how we started. But then obviously we had to change that because it made no sense once we're a duo to be the other Mark Miller and his wife, Heather. It's kind of awkward, um, especially on the billing. So we changed our name to So Long Solo. And then that's what we did um, touring together for five years. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I think that there are seasons, right? You know, you probably really mm. enjoyed that. But, you know, you mm. get to the season where like you're having kids and all of that. And you're like, and you, like you said, you look back and you're like, wow, we're making 40,000 a year and we're busting our butts and we're not home hardly ever. Right. And, and I know for me, cause I toured when I had young kids and it was mm. actually really great because you can drag them along. They can't, they kind of might complain, but they think it's kind of cool, you know, cause they get extra things at Starbucks when we're on the road and, you know, they get to like man the merch table and they get to meet a lot of cool new people and they get to see new places. So little kids don't care. But when they get older, then they're just like, uh, I, well, first of all, you, they have to go to school. And so you can't take them. And then they get annoyed that you're gone. So mm -hmm. I completely understand why you might have switched out of that as well. And I think that that's totally fine. Like we have seasons and you made the most of that season. And now you're making the most of this season and you're helping other artists. And that's kind of very similar to my journey, right? Yeah, it's amazing. And it's for people to have the experience like what you've had and to be able to share that, you know, because uh, I'm not sure what your journey was like starting out. Um, I loved and learned, <laughs> but I know for me, I had no idea what I was doing. Oh, and that was me. very few people to lead the way, you know, again, like, you know, going to a college, like you said, where it's all, it's more like conservatory style. It wasn't a conservatory. It was liberal arts college, but you know, not teaching us anything about business whatsoever. It's just like, yeah. we're going to make you an amazing musician, but then we'll just throw you on the street and hope you know what to do with it. Because <laughs> we're not going to tell you, we're not going to give you any clue. We're not going to give you any career guidance or anything. Um, and so, yeah, I was, I was floundering for many years. I had a, I had a degree in accounting as well. I got a double degree. And so I was amazing. doing accounting for years, right? I actually ended up working at an opera company. So that was great. Uh, getting the opportunity to work with artists, but here I was, you know, wanting to be an artist watching all these other artists doing what they wanted paying them their paychecks and I was frustrated you know because wow. I wanted to do my thing so that was kind of how mine mine started until I was able to figure out how to marry like you said a new business plan right I had to figure out how to marry the business and the music and mm -hmm. being that I had both of those in my world and I wasn't putting them together which seems a little crazy now but I just didn't I didn't know I didn't realize yeah, what an incredible skill set to have <laughs> to, yeah. to bring in at that point. Yeah, and so yeah. obviously you have some business background or you're learning because you're now starting this, you know, you had an entertainment company, you were helping artists, and now you've mm -hmm. got this new uh, cool label coin. So why don't you tell us a little bit about that? 
Yeah, no, for sure. Um, so I guess fast forward in, into Nashville, um, you know, our artist agency 2019, we were the college booking agency of the year, which was pretty cool to you wow. know, get those kind of accolades and know that people liked working with us uh, as much as we liked working with them. But then, you know, COVID hit and we're in 2020, all shows are canceled, you know, things are looking pretty ugly. And, um, and I met um, a guy in my, who's my co-founder, uh, Chad Peterson. So Chad's a, a former Wall Street guy. He was an investment banker, um, you know, and, and a VC investor. He was there working in the finance world during the big giant Wall Street crash of 2008 mm. and um, lost his, his job along with a lot of other people. And he started a nonprofit at that point to help people that had their lives devastated um, to get back on their feet. So um, he ended up over the long course of his storied history, um, moved to Nashville to be CFO of Skyway Studios. And, um, and so that's why he was there doing a lot of other nonprofit work. And when, when COVID happened and he's here in Music City, not knowing a lot about the music industry, but knowing, um, he's like, this looks a whole lot like Wall Street, like what we went through. And, um, and so he's like, I've got to do something to help. And so he started a nonprofit called Hope 20. Uh, got a big grant from the government, was able to help a ton of musicians get through that season. And that's how we were introduced to, to kind of help in, in part with that. Um, and, and so, you know, Chad, um, you know, being, being the finance guy, he came, he had this idea that was, that was kind of brewing in his mind of what happens if we could bring the future income of musicians forward to now, you know, taking what's, what he's been doing in Wall Street with securities and trying to, you know, value future revenue, bring it now so people can invest in it. And um, so he brought this idea to me of, of securitizing music. I'm like, oh man, there's something here that's truly brilliant. Mm -hmm. And so I, I said, okay, what happens if we, um, if we marry this with what's happening in the blockchain technology right now? Um, I've been you know, getting a lot deeper into you. And, um, and then focus on songs specifically and find a way to make songs investable to the average fan. You know, what, what would happen if an artist could bring 10 years of their streaming royalty income forward to right now and, and then be able to have a more engaged fan base? Uh, and so that's that's how we we started what is now label coin uh, and it's become you know what we've coined Robin Hood for music and it's it's just that it's it's a stock exchange a song exchange um, where that's that's aimed at stamping out artistic poverty and making a living wage for artists. That is a really cool idea. So I mean I've definitely had people on my show talking about NFTs and things. So I'd love to know kind of how would you compare this to the income an artist can earn from an NFT? How is this mm -hmm. different? Yeah, there's some really cool stuff happening in the music NFT space. That's really exciting. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges right now with that is that you have to change your business model significantly or your marketing model or the work you do as an artist. You know, it's kind of like Patreon, right? Yeah, you can get people donating to you, but now you're writing 150 postcards every month, uh, you know, trying to send out t-shirts or trying to do fan shows or specific things to, to, you know, outside of your norm, right, of just recording, perform shows, connect with fans online. Um, and so I, I feel like a lot of the NFT space right now, um, there's some artists being really successful there, which is very exciting, and, but you have to be like in Twitter spaces, you know, learning that world, learning where the people are that can invest, because it's, it's tricky and there's a little bit of a barrier still on how to invest in an NFT and what does it mean? And the technology is all a little bit, you know, confusing. Um, so while we're implementing that into our second phase, in our first phase, what we're, we're building on blockchain technology, that underlying thing that the NFTs work on, um, but it's all like done under the surface uh, so that people don't have to know anything about crypto to invest or as an artist to do it. And it works seamlessly within their current workflow. So what we do is we have a, a song valuation formula that, that goes off of a lot of what's happening now with song catalog sales. Um, like if you've seen like Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and like how they're selling these catalogs for hundreds of millions of dollars, right? Right. Um, so they, you know, they value those. They, they look at basically the average of the past three years of, of revenue from those songs and they project it forward anywhere from, you know, 18 to almost 30 years in some cases. And then that's the value of the catalog that they're selling. So um, we, we're taking those models and, and what's called discounted cash flow. And, and it's, you know, that's Chad's world, especially. And, right. um, but taking those models, adding a bunch more factors into it about how do we value these people that are more independent or, you know, I mean, we built this for independence all the way up to the major labels, but how do we, when they're newer, when they don't have all that history, how do we still find a valuation? And so pulling in other data, such as like their, um, 
you know, their show, their tour history, their teams, um, you know, of course, the, the history of their other songs, what's going on. And then we project that out over about 10 years is kind of our, our goal to kind of target it. And, um, and so that, that gives us a valuation, but it's still, even there's like a fantasy football number, right? Mm -hmm. Like we all think Patrick Mahomes is going to get four touchdowns next Sunday, but he might get two or he might get eight or he might break his leg. Please don't Patrick Mahomes. I love you. (laughs) Um, but like, you know, it's, it's kind of that ballpark number. And then the artist chooses, okay, what do I actually want to sell this for? And and how much do I want to sell? And specifically they're selling their digital streaming royalties and not the master's but it's under the master. So that way they have full control, but they're just sharing that, that profit share of the royalties. So, um, so then they would say, okay, yeah, I want to sell 10% or 20% or whatever of those royalties at this value, at this price. Then the fan sees, of course, our valuation, they see what the, the artist is selling it for. And then they see one other really important number. And that is um, like the estimate of how many spins that, that song would have to get in order for them to get say a 10% return every year or a 20% or whatever their goal is. So they can have a clear expectation um, coming up front. So then the artist earns, you know, we time with the distributor. So that at that point, so if the artist wants to sell 10%, then we get a 10% split with the distributor and then we pay out all the song holders. So it's super easy to lift on the artist, and it's just kind of fits into their normal workflow, um, their normal life, because you're at a show. Hey, if you like this song, uh, you can buy it. (laughs) <laughs> here go ahead and invest in my song and then they earn 98 percent of that listing plus a part of the transaction fee every time it's resold and resold and resold into the future wow so if i owned part of your song i could resell it to someone else yeah exactly okay i love the idea of an of the artist earning every time someone sells it because that seems totally fair and really helps the artist versus you know, like the kind of thing where you buy something at a store and then you sell it at a garage sale and then someone else sells it at a garage sale. You know what I mean? And that original <laughs> yeah. person that made that thing didn't get any more money. So I love that idea of it continuing to pay the artist forward. I think where I get like, you know, I have a hard time wrapping my head around it. Well, number one, is it really valued around like their current like fan base and how much they can can bring in and how many streams they've already had? How much does it relate to like just how good the song is? Because sometimes there's just an yeah. amazing song, but it like hasn't been out there. Or not enough people know about it. Really important, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So we, we built in a song discovery mode that people can swipe over it in the app and go in, into that mode. And then when they listen to a song, it's, it's unbiased. They don't know the name of the song. They don't even see the album art. They just get to rank it. <laughs> on, on a few things and then they get a reward for ranking it once they rank it then they see that the song they can buy it they can follow that artist but um, they get rewarded for doing that and then they can with that buy song shares or notes in our in a secondary little market that we have or merch or different items like that um, so it's a way for for really trying to create that that opportunity but yeah and so we some of the initial people that we saw doing this are a lot of the artists that maybe they have a hundred thousand or 50,000 or that if that traction are touring regularly, there's a lot of those people, you know, there's 1.75 million songs with more than 200,000 spins on Spotify. Mm. You know, that's a lot of artists, a lot of people that, um, you know, that could value their songs easily at at least $20,000, you know, or much, much, much more. And so, yeah, I think initially there's going to be people that maybe they're selling that song for 2,500 or, or 5,000 or, you know, for maybe 50% of it or whatever they want to come, come in at. But that can make a big difference at that early stage. And, um, and also for the, you know, it gets fans engaged. You know, what if you do discover that person? And then this song blows up this artist. Remember, if, if you're the first one to get into Taylor Swift or, or Ed Sheeran or, you know, <laughs> and find these artists at that level, Uh, it's a pretty cool investment opportunity. Well, I think that's super exciting and fun. Like some, for me, somebody that, um, I don't know if you know, but I have another branch of what I do called women of substance that I've had since 2007. And we are a platform that promotes music by female artists in all genres. And so I'm, I'm the person, I'm the curator, like I'm the one that Mm. says yay or nay, you know, last say on all the songs. So I choose them all. And I've, you know, had how many years is that? 14 years of like listening to people's songs and, you know, knowing what I think is really, really good and just mm. hits me immediately. And I think that's really cool and exciting to think if I could found, uh, found a song through Women of Substance where I'm like, this song is amazing. Like if only more people knew about it and I could invest in that. But then 
as a person that invested, then I would have a vested interest literally in making that song blow up. So then as an investor, do I have the right to go out there and like rally the troops and say, everybody go stream this song. It's amazing. Yeah. Or is that absolutely. like a conflict of interest? Cause that's what I feel like. It's like maybe a con it's almost like gamifying the system or something. I mean, there is some like securities law because all these songs are registered securities, right? But um, as long as you're like not saying, hey, I don't own any of this necessarily, but there's still like kind of that fine line between this is just a great song. You can always just say this is a great song, like, hey, because it is, but um, but that's fine. And we actually built a feature just for people like you uh, called curated collections, which are basically song mutual funds. And it's, and as a song picker, as a curator, oh my gosh, you would be I need able to, to own a song mutual fund. That is so cool. <laughs> exactly exactly right and anyone can do that and what's really cool about it is actually as the curator you would earn five percent of the royalties for that fund so you know really creating a new revenue stream for the people that are great at finding the next great song Ooh, that's pretty that's pretty neat i love that um but there's no because i know it's like you know there's insider trading and all that stuff like mm -hmm. uh, for stocks right mm -hmm. is it okay for me to go out there and like promote this song and like share it on all social media if I own a percentage of it yeah absolutely I mean that's what artists are doing right now right 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 that's their they, song. they own the song and then but hey please listen to it <laughs> we make money from it yeah yep interesting so. okay so now what I'm having trouble wrapping my head around is about like the distribution right because yeah. do they still go through a regular distributor like CD Baby or then are you the distributor or how does that work yeah, no, we partner with distributors so they can go through their regular distributor as long as they have splits enabled or are ones that can partner with us. Um, so like CD Baby's great or, you know, um, District Kid, different right. places like that that make it simple to, to do that. And so it's, again, we're just tying into their normal workflow. It's pretty seamless. So you would enable it inside of your distributor platform? Uh, we're working on those integrations. I think those will come into the, the near future. Right now, what we're talking with distributors is specifically doing just, just the splits. So basically, we have to confirm that, one, that you own the rights to the song, of course. And then if you're selling 10% of the song on our platform, then we get a 10% split with the distributor to where LabelCoin is listed. And so now, now when the distributor gets that money from the DSPs, from Spotify, Apple Music, et cetera, then they give 10% of that to us that we then distribute to all the rights holders. Okay, so I, as the artist, I decide how much of it I'm going to sell. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to sell any percentage of it. You can choose, like if I chose 50%, then I yeah. would give over 50% to LabelCoin. And then you guys would offer that in your marketplace for people to buy. And that's where the artist would get the money. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. What and, if nobody um, buys it? Did they give away half of their, their royalty? No until someone buys it that's a great question so though so we keep paying you all the royalties for any unsold notes so you'll never like cool. it's okay. never gone until it's until it's sold okay okay i think i'm getting this now <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> it's like you know these web3 like technology stuff and i'm like how does this integrate into this to the system that we already have mm -hmm. you know what i mean with the way the distributors work so this covers all streaming like anything that you've selected inside of your distributor so like if i've selected TikTok and youtube and all of that does it does it cover that as well it does so everything that the distributors are collecting um can be sold wow that's really cool yeah. okay let's see do i have any other questions about this because i just i really want artists to understand what this is and and how how it would benefit them and how it mm -hmm. works because i think sometimes it's like that sounds really cool but Number one, it's a little scary when you don't understand all the moving parts and like, mm -hmm. you know, whether like you're you kind of feel like you're signing away part of your rights, you know, whatever you decide to choose your percentage to label coin, but you're like, I don't know if someone's going to buy it. So I'm really glad that you still continue to pay them. And, and I'm assuming you take some small percentage. We do. We get 2% okay. um, of that listing. So we keep it basically trying to keep it as small as possible. And then every time people are buying these song shares, these notes, um, there's a small transaction fee. It's, it's around 40 cents in our current model, um, but we get 40% of that fee. And then we give artists 40% of that fee. And then 10% goes to distributors. And then 10% more goes into our song discovery fund into that, that we mentioned earlier. Got it. Okay. And is there like a, 
what is the smallest percentage that they can sell or what is the smallest amount? Like, can someone have made mm-hmm. nothing on this song yet and still sell it? Uh, you certainly could. So uh, we haven't totally finalized that number yet. We're thinking it's probably maybe somewhere around twenty five hundred dollars um, worth. And so, you know, there's there's still those people like when I I never released an album right before two thousand five, but but I had people that had heard me play or, or my friends and my family who are like, yeah, I want to support that song. And so, you know, they gave me money to to do it. We do it right now for Kickstarter, right? A lot of right. us. Um, and so it's. So we feel like there's still there's always going to be people that will be like, yeah, I'll support that as long as the song is good, as long as the artist is as quality, or at least people like them, <laughs> then they'll be able to sell. Basically, it just gives them a mechanism. So instead of begging for cash, instead of what we call fan handling, um, oh, you know, man. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> right? It, you're you actually are giving people a chance to invest and make their money back and say, yeah, I believe in you, and and that's a totally different feeling for an artist too to not have to be be begging, but be like, hey, you know, you, you actually you get to, to buy into what I'm doing while I still maintain full control of my career of my future and not signing away the next five albums or, you know, um, my life and, and hoping it works out. So, That's so empowering for the artist instead of, mm-hmm. you know, when these artists do these like go fund me things. And I'm like, you, you're not going to really in- excite people with this. I'm a starving artist. Please support me. I can't pay my bills you know, angle, <laughs> like this is, this is so much more empowered angle. Yeah. yeah. And that was the goal. And that's why we really feel like it can help end artistic poverty. Yeah. So, oh, definitely. Now, but, can they do that? Does it have to be like a new release or can you go back and sell like previous releases? You can. Back catalogs are great. We would love for people to bring on their back catalogs. Um, so oh, yes, please. So I'm even eligible. I'm not releasing new music and anytime soon, but like I do have a back catalog. So that's an interesting idea. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Of course, you're going to see the most traction as an artist if you're continuing to release, right. because that's what it tends to, you know, keep the spins coming and, and keep interest. Um, but there's, there's still lots of opportunities for every artist. Wow. Oh, that's very, very cool. Okay. So if an artist is listening to all this and they're like, well, this is very interesting. Like, how do I get started? Like, what's the process like for them to get started? Yeah, so we've been developing about a year. We're on target to release the end of this year. So, but right now they can go to labelcoin.io and they can sign up there and join our, our founding artists circle. And so uh, for, the, for the people that join now, you're basically getting to help fine tune some of the features, give feedback uh, on the app itself on different options. And then you'll get early access as well so it is a little bit tiered based on on following and what's happening in the artist like how much they're touring right now things like that Mm -hmm. but we will be getting everybody everybody it will be an open platform that everyone will be able to use so by signing up now they'll get in early they'll be some of the first and those are also the people that we're putting our marketing money behind to uh, help push this so our whole plan is basically make their song successful because if if we make your song successful then we know that we're going to be successful so we're just trying to elevate the artist Got it. And and does it cost the artist money to sign up? Does not. Wow. So okay. yeah. So, so yeah, labelcoin.io and, and over on our socials too, just at labelcoin all over the place. We'd love to, to connect and stay in touch and, and bring more artists on board. That's awesome. Okay. Is there anything we haven't covered that you think artists need to know about what you guys do and you know your mission and what you what your plans for for the future and what where you see kind of the artist economy going? Sure. Well, I think especially for artists right now that um, that have been able to embrace the new technology and jump into NFTs and into the music web three space, um, I, I'd want them to know that it's it's not necessarily exclusive. Like, hey, one or the other in that sense. And actually, in our second phase next year, we're working on uh, an aggregated NFT marketplace. So where whatever the, wherever the NFT, NFTs are hosted, whether they're on OpenSea or, or some other space, Sound XYZ, they can have those integrated into one spot and the artist profile where their fans can find it. And then we'll also, we'll have um, NFT mintings uh, on our platform at that point as well. Being able to tie to different utilities such as, okay, if, if someone owns a hundred notes of my song or of my songs collectively, then they get minted an NFT that gives them you know, backstage passes or meet and greets or 20% off merch or whatever that kind of different avenue is. So we're constantly trying to think, and then we're also going into actually NFT concert tickets. And so even though in, in first phase, we still have some really cool features that can help drive touring. 
because we're trying to look at this holistically. How do we help every single person and entity in the industry, but also just um, all the things that an artist is challenged with, how do we help them be free to just do what they're meant to do and, and, and empowered. And so we have this feature called geofencing where um, it's like it sounds, they're able to turn it on and off. And so if they want to say, hey, you can only buy these notes at my shows, like for the first month or whatever that is, then if people want to invest in your songs, they actually have to buy a ticket and be present in order to, to get that opportunity. So another way to drive ticket sales, to drive people to those shows uh, and to find you. Huh. Wow. I mean, I feel like there's so many things that are going to be developing over the next few years that we can't even mm. know about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or we can't even fully understand what it's going to be. I mean, the idea. So when you first approached me with this and I was, and it's, it's, it was like, um, your tagline is something like pay artists for their future earnings now or something. And I was like, how is that possible? Like I had a hard time <laughs> understanding how that could be possible. And I do think that some artists that might read that might think, oh, that's too good to be true. And like, just, you know, push it to the side. Like, oh, I don't believe that that's not real. So how, you know, is, how are you going to kind of help artists understand that like this is really possible and it's not like mm. some pie in the sky kind of thing? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're already seeing it. We're just bringing that model forward to now. I think it's, you know, we're kind of in a unique position um, because I've, I've been in the industry almost 20 years now um, in the music industry, but then Chad, you know, with all his time in the finance industry to find actually what is that viable path forward? Like I could have never have done this without Chad, you know? Right, right. I have no idea how all these models No, it work. really is a what marriage is that of two you know? totally separate industries that yeah. like just the idea of him understanding all the security stuff mm -hmm. that like I certainly wouldn't be able to put, wrap my head around that and how it will work with music. Yeah, and so it, it's happening now. People are already giving out of the kindness of their hearts. How much more will they when they're actually investing, mm -hmm. you know? You know, Patreon's raised what over three point five billion dollars, something like that, and Kickstarter's over six, somewhere in that in that neighborhood. Um, you know, and people are what getting a T-shirt and maybe a house show. That's probably not going to happen. <laughs> but <laughs> I didn't say that. I'm sure. I'm sure that everybody here is fulfilling. Right. Everyone their, their fulfills 100%. on all their rewards. Yeah, <laughs> all the time. I, I had to make like sixty handmade ceramic mugs, and let me tell you, that was a, that was it was a fun summer. But um, I think I made three seventy five an hour. Uh -huh. basically when you like break it down so that wasn't when you're doing a kickstarter don't do handmade ceramic mugs please right save yourself wow yeah and i just it's exciting to me that it really does put more of the artist's career back in their own hands and like they can focus more on creating amazing music mm. and and you know being able to get paid for that part of what they do yeah. Right. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like right now artists really don't get paid for the creation of the music most of the time. Yeah. You know, they get paid for all the things around it, the performing, the merch that, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, they can do Patreon and do, but usually that's like, oh, I, I provide extra things. I do extra, you know, a, a show or like a online show with just my patrons or whatever, but it's never, they're not really getting paid for just the music anymore. Mm-hmm. And this yeah. is a way they can do it. Yeah, that's right? what we're excited about. Absolutely. Awesome. Well, okay. So you said at LabelCoin at all social medias. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, you guys go, go connect with them, check them out, see if this is something that you want to get started in. I don't see why you wouldn't. There's really no downside, in my opinion, to getting started with LabelCoin. So I would go check it out, all of you guys. Uh, and thank you so much, Mark. This has been really an interesting conversation. And really taking the music industry in, in ways that I hadn't, I couldn't have thought of. So I, I always love that when, when someone comes up with an idea that is just like, to me, like left field, but amazing. And I see how it can work. So thank you. And thank you for everything you're trying to do for artists. Hey, thank you too, Brie. Thank you so much for having me on. Uh, really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Profitable Musician Show. I would love to know your takeaways and aha moments from this episode. Leave me a comment over at ProfitableMusician.com so I can bring you more of the information, interviews, and resources that you love. Thanks to Rondi Fay, one of my Academy members, for providing the music for our podcast. You can check her out at RondiFay.com. That's R-A-N-D-I-F-A-Y.com. 
Just remember, knowledge is power, but without implementation, it is useless. And inspiration without action is merely entertainment. But I know you're not just a dreamer, you are a doer. And I promise I'll be here every week to support you and remind you that you can be a profitable musician.